in the next talk will be Be Deniable Public Key Encryption by O'Neill, Piker, and Waters. And, uh, and Chris Piker will give the talk. Okay. There you go. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, my time's up already. Oh, no, no, I'll, I'll fix that. Okay. Don't worry. Yeah. Thank you. You, you can start, don't worry, I'll give okay. you the full. Okay. Thing. You'll, you'll so this work is uh, by Deniable uh, Public Key Encryption with Adam O'Neill and Brent Waters. Um, so many talks start with a story, and this one is no different. Uh, today's story, Alice and Bob are siblings, and one of them's away at school, and they, they want to plan a party for their big brother for when Alice comes home to school. So uh, they're using public key encryption to keep their messages safe because uh, big brother is watching them. And uh, so Alice encrypts this message saying, let's have a surprise party for big brother, and, and big brother sees, uh, sees his traffic goes by, but it's encrypted so he can't tell uh, what the message is. But uh, he's awfully curious about it, so when she comes home, uh, he kind of uses his prerogative as a big brother and twists their arm and says, hey, tell me your pub you know, the coins that you used to encrypt this, and t hey, Bob, tell me the uh, secret key that you used, and the party's now ruined. So that's pretty unfortunate uh, for everybody all around. <clears throat> so what we would like is, is something um, called by deniability, and we'd like a property like this that Alice can send Bob uh, a, an encrypted ciphertext using some kind of deniably encrypted, uh, uh, deniably encrypted process, encryption process, and Bob should be able to decrypt Alice's message correctly. But if uh, Bob, uh, rather, if Big Brother comes around and tries to twist their arm, or maybe in advance anticipating that he might do so, Alice and Bob can prepare some fake encryption coins on the left and a fake secret key on the right so that when Big Brother does come around, and uh, they have to hand these, these keys and coins over, magically it looks like an innocuous message that everyone can agree on. Okay, so uh, looks, the fake coins and keys actually make it look as if another message had been encrypted. Okay, and encrypted honestly. It's not like, there's nothing suspicious about these coins and keys. Okay, so uh, an important fact is, an important thing about the model we're considering is that the coercion is always after the fact. So Alice and Bob uh, are able to encrypt and decrypt you know, uh, not subject to any coercion, but then later on they might be coerced to reveal their coins. And this is really a kind of a dual concept to uh, something that uh, Benelow and Tunistra, Tunistra called uh, uncoercible com communication, which uh, would allow Alice, you know, when she's under control of, uh, of Big Brother, to send a message, but uh, secretly indicate that, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being coerced to send this message, so ignore it, okay? So we're talking about after the fact coercion here today. So uh, there are, you know, this is a kind of a toy example, but there are a lot of serious examples where uh, deniability might be, might be needed. Uh, kind of any kind of anti-coercion um, scenario, Roger Dingledine's talk gave countless uh, excellent examples of, of scenarios where people might be able, uh, might really need uh, deniability for their own safety uh, or security. Um, so for example, journalists or whistleblowers uh, really would, uh, who might want to keep their uh, sources safe uh, would definitely benefit well from deniability. Uh, these two fellows know uh, definitely well. Uh, or if you find yourself on a, a dip with a different kind of big brother to deal with, you might need it. Uh, deniability has often been proposed for voting uh, protocols. And the basic idea is that, well, if you encrypt your vote, but then later on your, uh, your boss asks you to show how you voted, um, well, you could reveal any vote. So you know, there's no way to force you to uh, reveal your vote, or you couldn't be able to sell your vote. Come back to this. Um, question a little bit later. Uh, in terms of theoretical cryptographic concepts, it's a nice concept because it actually implies a strong notion called selective opening security for uh, encryption. And um, it also implies something called non-committing encryption, uh, which helps you design adaptively secure protocols. But it's that's actually strictly stronger than both of these. In particular, uh, four, property four, it's stronger because the ciphertexts that are equivocable actually can be decrypted by real players. They're not just generated by a simulator. So they actually have real content behind them. Okay, so those are applications. Uh, there's been some prior work. This uh, notion was first formalized in this paper, CDNO, Kennedy, Dwork, Nero, and Ostrovsky in 97. And uh, they, they give nice definitions and uh, some feasibility results. They showed that sender-deniable uh, public key encryption is possible. So it allows you to coerce only the sender, but not the receiver. And then they also show that you can, with interaction, you can kind of flip the roles of the two players. So you could coerce only the receiver, but not the sender. Uh, and, 
And then they also showed that you could do uh, bi-deniable encryption if you interact with third parties, as long as at least one of those parties doesn't, uh, remains uncoerced. Okay, and then, in, but in practice, people have also asked for uh, this kind of, some kind of deniability property. Um, it usually goes by the name of plausible deniability. So there are pro pro uh, programs called TrueCrypt or rubber hose file system. Uh, they basically allow you to say, um, if you're coerced to reveal what's on your hard drive or decrypt what's on your hard drive, you can say, well, there, this part of the hard drive is actually just random noise. I never stored anything here. So uh, there's no message there, move along. Um, now that might be, work well for storage with your, within your own computer, but it's arguably not very useful for communication because if you're sending messages back and forth, uh, it's hard for you to argue, well, there's, there's actually no message here. I've just been talking to Bob for years. Okay? So um, anyway, we'd like something more and we'd like to actually be able to equivocate the message and not just claim that there's no message there at all. So in this work we give, uh, we, we make some uh, progress on these problems. We give uh, bi-deniable encryption schemes. This means that you can simultaneously coerce the sender and the receiver, uh, and you can reveal any message that you like, uh, ch even chosen as late as the time of coercion or in advance. And this works importantly in what's called the multidistributional, or for um, my own mouth's sake, what I'll call the flexible deniability model. And what that means is that there are actually alternative deniable key generation and encryption algorithms which uh, Alice and Bob would run in advance, but then when they get coerced, they would actually equivocate and claim to have run the normal uh, sanctioned uh, encryption and, uh, and key generation algorithms. So I'll say more about how we formalize this later. So I want to emphasize these are true public key schemes. They're non-interactive uh, in contrast to the previous bi-deniable scheme, and there's no third parties. We actually give two uh, very different styles of schemes. Uh, one is a generic construction uh, it's based on what's called uh, simulatable encryption, and an idea introduced by Dumgard and Nielsen. And they introduced it for the purpose of non-committing encryption, and we find it interesting that it's possible to actually build deniable encryption with this basic primitive. And then we have a special, uh, some arguably more efficient or different, uh, definitely, certainly more efficient and definitely different uh, construction that uses some peculiar properties of lattice encryption. Uh, now, both of these schemes have key sizes greater than the message size. But if you think about it for a moment, this is inherent because if you have a fixed ciphertext and you want to be able to open it in 10 different ways, there must be at least 10 different secret keys that you can reveal. So it's inherent, but it's still not very uh, nice because we'd like to be able to encrypt messages that are longer than the keys. So we give a way to do this with a, a, lim a restricted notion called plan ahead by deniability. And plan ahead basically means uh, you give up on this ability to reveal any message under coercion. You simply say that in advance I'll choose two, three, some bounded number of messages which I can then later reveal. And, uh, and now we can do it with short keys and long messages. Okay. Um, interesting, this is an analog of what's called somewhat non-committing encryption by uh, Gary Wix and Zo from Crypto09. And another good benefit of this is that the sender and receiver automatically uh, agree on what is the fake message and what's the real message. Um, when you have this coercion problem, you have the problem of, well, if you put Alice and Bob in separate rooms and tell them you know, what, what was the real message, they might equivocate to different messages, and that would look bad. So the plan ahead scheme actually tell, you know, lets them both know what the, the innocent message is. Uh, and then third, we give some analogous solutions and models in the identity-based setting. And this is kind of an interesting setting uh, that's arguably pretty, interest, uh, pretty useful because it says that uh, in the identity-based setting, you aren't the curator or generator of your own secret keys. Rather, you go to a, a public key of, a generator or an authority who extracts a secret key for you. So the model is something like when you go you know, under coercion, you say, well, I have to go to the, the public key generator to get my secret key. And you can tell the public key generator, hey, please make it decrypt in this way rather than the real, real message. Uh, there's also been some subsequent work uh, following uh, the first announcement of, uh, of our results here. So in the past uh, Eurocrypt, there was a uh, paper on interactive, uh, an interactive scheme which gets uh, full sender deniability. So not in the flexible model, but rather in the full, uh, full deniability model. Uh, it uses an interesting uh, primitive called sampleable encryption, which really looks like uh, it solves the problem. Um, but unfortunately, if you look very closely, there turns out to be a fatal bug. Uh, and it, for some reason, it, it doesn't seem to be enough to, to solve the problem. So uh, full deniability is really a very interesting problem, even just for one side, even with interaction. Uh, it's a very neat problem. Uh, a second work which will appear in um, 
the upcoming Asia Crypt uh, by Benvlin et al. Uh, they actually show that fully receiver deniable encryption is, is impossible. Um, so formally, that statement means if your secret key is only sigma bits long, then uh, there's always a way to distinguish between uh, real messages and faked messages with one over sigma distinguishing advantage. So basically, uh, there's no hope to get full receiver deniability if your scheme is non-interactive. Um, so this actually motivates why we really have to work in this uh, flexible deniability model. And so again, when faced with this impossibility, we don't deny it, we're just going to be flexible about our security notion. Okay, so this is the model uh, that we ask for, flexible by deniability. As usual, we have three uh, algorithms, so key generation, encryption, and decryption. And these three by themselves form a valid uh, encryption scheme. So de decryption is correct, it's semantically secure, and so forth. And then on top of those three things, we have uh, deniable algorithms, so a deniable key generator and a deniable encryption algorithm, and corresponding faking algorithms. And so here's what we ask for uh, the deniability experiment uh, security-wise. So for any two message bits, uh, B and B prime, the left experiment is simply you generate a key, you encrypt a bit B, and then uh, the coercer comes along and says, give me your keys and coins, and you hand them over. Okay, so that's what the coercer gets to see. There's actually a lot of redundancy here. Um, it's enough to give the coercer just S, K, and R, because um, he can derive P, K, and, and C from that. Uh, but that's what you get. And then the, uh, the alternative experiment is what happens when you actually use the deniable uh, algorithms. So now we uh, deniably generate a public key together with something called a faking key. And then we deniably encrypt a message, the message B prime, uh, okay, to get a ciphertext. And then later when the uh, <clears throat> coercer comes along, we use this faking algorithm together with a faking key to say, you know what, I want ciphertext C to decrypt uh, as a message bit B. And that's gonna output some fake secret key here. And uh, the receiver, uh, sorry, the, the sender simultaneously runs, he says, here's my original randomness that I used, I'd like, this bit B prime that I originally encrypted to appear as if I encrypted a B. And so that's going to output some fake uh, encryption randomness. And as usual, the uh, coercer gets to see all, all four items. Okay, so we'd like these two experiments to be uh, indistinguishable. Uh, even better, well, instead of a secret key, you could actually have the coins for gen. We'll treat these as if they're equivalent, but in the paper we show that coins uh, can be done. Okay, so, and, and just, just to give you an idea, full, full deniability would say, uh-uh, you can't use different algorithms here, you actually have to run gen and enc here, and uh, you, they're still faking algorithms, but they have to take the original coins and the, the original coins here. Okay, so that's what we would ask for. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's after lunch, we're all digesting, so I think I'll keep it pretty light, and I won't go into too many technical details, but I'd rather uh, consider, you know, is this definition actually meaningful or, or useful? And um, there are kind of two, two common objections that, uh, that have often been raised about deniability in general and the flexible model. And the first objection is, well, you know, everybody knows that you could have, you could have run these faking algorithms, so who do you think you're fooling you know, when the coercer comes along? You're not gonna convince them that you really sent this message that you're claiming to have sent. And I say, yeah, you're, you're not. Uh, the point is not to convince anybody. I mean, everyone knows they could be faked and that's, that's the world we live in. So the point is that if you consider like perfectly secure communication, talking through a lead pipe where there's no record at all that anything had happened, this is ideally perfectly deniable. You can claim after the fact to have said anything uh, to anybody. But the problem is that encryption itself has this side effect that mostly, usually it introduces a risk of being coerced. So now there's a record of a ciphertext that you sent, and now you can later be coerced to open it up. Okay, so this is an undesirable side effect, and deniable encryption is attempting to get rid of that uh, side effect. Okay, so you're not, trying, you're not gonna fool anybody into believing, uh, into convincing the coercer of anything, but actually just to preempt the possibility of coercion in the first place by making it useless. Okay, the second objection is typically to this uh, flexible model which is a very natural question. The first one you think of is, well, there's these alternative uh, deniable generation and, and encryption algorithms. Why wouldn't the coercer just ask for the coins from those algorithms? Okay. Um, and, and if he did, then, then there would be a way to, uh, 
you know, you wouldn't have a way to, to equivocate your message. And the answer is, yeah, uh, he could. He could ask for those coins. Uh, I, I would recommend as a user that you just really insist, no, I really did run the recommended algorithms. Okay, Jan and Inc. Um, the courser has no evidence. You know, he may have reason to believe that you want to change your message, but he really has no evidence that you ran those alternative algorithms. And had you run these original algorithms, you couldn't give him the coins of the deniable algorithms. Okay, you just computationally wouldn't be able to. So there are kind of two cases here. The first is that the coercer says, eh, you know, I guess I've, I've sent my subpoena, you've submitted you know, what you claim, and uh, I have to be happy with that. So the coercer goes away and all's well, and, and, and we win. Um, the second case is that maybe the coercer says, no, I'm not satisfied. I'm really gonna punish you and put you in prison until you give me coins for uh, Jen and Inc. Okay? Um, in that case, uh, you're arguably living in kind of an unjust society because there's no reason to believe that you've run these algorithms, but here you are rotting in jail. So um, flexible deniability does allow you to, to cry uncle and say, okay, okay, I admit it, I ran the deniable algorithms, here are the coins, uh, and now you've, now you've proved what message was truly sent. Um, the problem is, if you're in this world, deniability is the least of your problems. Uh, in fact, full deniability doesn't even save you uh, in that world. Because, again, just as you could with flexible deniability, um, anticipating that you might end up rotting in jail until you prove in a, in a valid way that you've, uh, what message you've really encrypted, well, you could just use verifiable randomness, like the digits of pi, to encrypt, right? So there's still a way in a full deniable scheme to prove the way that, uh, that you really sent the message, okay? So um, arguably, it's, it's not a flexible versus full uh, problem there. So this also calls into question the applicability to voting, because if you really want to sell your vote, you can even do so in a fully deniable scheme, just by using digits of pi or some kind of output of a pseudorandom generator, something like that. Okay, so uh, now I will do some uh, technical uh, things, but still with pictures. So uh, the main tool for deniability from the CDNO paper is something they called translucent sets, which is a really nice idea. Um, the idea is that we have the set U, which is the whole universe, and then inside of it, we have a set P, uh, which is parameterized by a public key. Okay, so the public key specifies what is this P set, and there's a trapdoor that comes along with, uh, with, this, with this translucent set. So there's a few simple properties. If you have the public key, you can sample efficiently from the P set. You can also sample from the U set just by picking K random bits. Uh, but a P sample is pseudorandom. So if you pick a, a random from P, it actually is indistinguishable computationally from if you had picked from the whole set. Uh, and so this allows you to fake uh, later on. You say you chose a P sample to start with, but then later on you can claim that it was a, a U sample just by saying, yeah, the P sample, I just picked these K random bits. Okay, so you can fake in one way from P to U, but not vice versa. And for the receiver, the receiver using the secret key can easily distinguish a P sample from a U sample. So the receiver can tell which, uh, which set it falls into. And there are many instantiations of, of this idea, uh, of this very basic idea. So let's see how you could do it, um, how could you use this to get a deniable encryption scheme. Well, the normal encryption scheme, to encrypt a zero, you just take two U samples. And to encrypt a one, you take a U sample and then a P sample. Okay, and Bob can tell which of the two samples they are, and so he can distinguish a zero from a one and decrypt. Uh, on the deniable side, the deniable encryption algorithm, to encrypt a zero, he just takes two P samples instead. And for the one, it's the same as before. So let's see what happens. Uh, the coercer comes along and Alice can fake. So for any, you know, if the original message is zero or one, it doesn't matter, you can fake it as a, as a zero or a one in either direction, uh, just by changing, claiming that P samples were actually U samples. Okay, so you can just check that all possibilities uh, are, are doable there. But if you course Bob, you get his secret key and uh, the, the true message is revealed. Okay, so we really need to work on the receiver side here. Um, so one of our contributions, this is one of the two um, uh, schemes, is something we call bi-translucent set. And it's to take care of this uh, receiver problem. So a public key now has many secret keys and the p-tests are slightly different. So uh, this, you know, this secret key might call those values p-samples, and this one might call those p-samples. And so the idea is, if you pick a p-sample, then most secret keys will uh, indeed classify it correctly. But uh, given the faking key, you can actually generate 
a secret key that makes uh, the p-sample fall outside. So it, forces, it makes it look as if uh, this p-sample is actually a u-sample. Okay, and so this allows Bob to fake a p as a u, and then using the previous encoding, everything works. So uh, instantiation uh, just uses the fact that uh, in the GPV identity-based encryption, you can cause a decryption error, but obliviously, so the user doesn't know it. Just kind of a, anyway, seemed like an annoying fact, uh, an annoying property that we're using for deniability. So uh, I have no time, so extensions, uh, just like I said, the planet had deniability is what, something we do, and full deniability is still a really uh, interesting open question. Thanks, I'll take your comments, questions. Is any question? Yeah. Sir. Yeah. Uh, in your definition, yeah. Uh, what if the faking key is also the view of the associate? Yeah, the faking key you can't reveal. Yeah, that's something you cannot reveal, you cannot reveal that. Yeah, the faking key is very special. It's not inherent, though. It's just because of the No, you, you, yeah, I, I don't see any reason why it uh, couldn't be, although revealing a faking key already reveals that you've run the, the deniable generator. So there's already some. Uh, the faking key is only output by the deniable generator. Right. So, yeah. so that someone sometime ran the Oh, okay, yeah, maybe they handed it, they handed it. Maybe this is on my time. Okay, yeah, 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 so good. Yeah. Question, yes? There actually are a large number of possible faking keys for, uh, for a given public key. We don't use that property, but uh, it's true. So, so That's right. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to bring up the question of privacy. Why don't we just go with that and erase it by default? Uh, yes, so the question is why not just erase? Uh, in fact, it's not very common for you to keep your encryption coins around. So, in coercing a sender, you know, I, I forgot my coins is, is definitely a, could be a credible answer. It's a, less of a credible answer for the receiver who typically has to keep his secret key around to, in order to decrypt things. So that's another reason why we wanted to, to focus on the receiver side uh, of things. But th there's discussion in the paper about erasures and what we think of them. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and if there are more questions, I'm sure that uh, Chris will be able to take them offline during the break.